Um, dois, três. Agora sim. Gente, bem-vindos, bem-vindas. Fico muito contente de que apesar da chuva, né? O que a nossa, nossa preocupação quando a gente faz eventos é, do inverno, especialmente, né? O inverno do verão também, né? Quando a gente faz evento aqui lá, lá em cima, é o tempo. O carioca fica assustado, mas vejo que as pessoas venceram os temíveis 18 graus, né? Que para o europeu não é tão frio assim, para vir a ouvir o Pietro Rufo, né? Eu dou as boas-vindas, benvenuto, benvenuto Pietro, e bem-vindos todos vocês. Estamos muito contentes e super agradecidos com o Consulado Italiano, com o Instituto Italiano de Cultura, a Libera Pone, a diretora do Instituto Italiano de Cultura, está aqui conosco hoje. É, eu fiquei muito contente quando ela tem sempre, temos essa relação muito, muito, muito boa, né? Que quando tem essa possibilidade de compartilhar a presença de um artista, de um expoente é, da cultura ita italiana, a gente é sempre muito aberto, né? Então, quero agradecer muito a Lívia, ela me, me disse que o Pietro Rufo ia amanhã, exatamente o Pietro, inaugura uma exposição é, no Centro Cultural dos Correios, amanhã às sete horas, né? Às sete do manhã. Então, antes de tudo, convido todos vocês, com amigos, companheiros, né? família, e visitar essa exposição, eu irei amanhã, muito curioso né, de ver essa instalação nova, essa exposição do Pietro Rufo na, no Centro Cultural do Correio, então ainda mais contente que essa pré-estreia é feita aqui no IED. Então hoje temos essa especial presença é, e a possibilidade de entender melhor a arte é, e a, a, a nova comunicação que o Pietro faz com a própria arte. O Pietro é, é arquiteto, é artista multidisciplinar, é designer, a gente pode dizer isso, né? que designer realmente é, tem um componente das duas coisas, da arte, da arquitetura, da, da cultura. O Pietro formou-se em Romano, de Roma, eu sou um pouco mais ao sul, mas eu estudo em Roma, então muito próximo é, da, cidade, da cidade imperial, é, formou-se em arquitetura em Roma, e a sua formação artística e cultural desenvolveu-se especialmente em Nova York, nos Estados Unidos, é onde ele começou a estudar graças a uma bolsa de estudo e lá formou-se, formou a própria consciência artística. O Pietro tem uma constelação de exposições individuais e as grandes instituições artísticas e, cultural, e culturais do mundo, né? tanto nos Estados Unidos, em Roma, no Maxi, é, de Roma, que é um museu importante de arte contemporânea, é, e as peças é, do, do Pietro estão na Farnicina. Farnicina é o ministério, é o nosso Itamaraty, o Ministério do Assunto Exterior e Italia. É, mas hoje, especialmente, o, o Pietro veio, vem aqui ao IED, e para todos vocês, e, e com ele junto, o acróbata aqui é o filho dele, é. ele trouxe parte da, da família, para apresentar uh, uma, uma parte do trabalho dele com um foco no argumento, numa temática especialmente é, contemporânea. Não somente para a Europa, porque na Europa... É, o fenômeno das migrações, que é um dos grandes temas, grandes temas do Pietro, dos conflitos em todos os sentidos, sociais, é, é, culturais também, é, mas diz, dizia não somente na Europa, mas no mundo todo. Hoje em dia, a migração, o movimento, o deslocamento de pessoas é um fenômeno com que estamos convivendo. Tem uma resistência em muitos, muitos países ao fenômeno migratório, que é uma resistência tola, uma resistência inútil, porque o homem sempre migrou e sempre se movimentou e mudou de lugar, e não tem força, não tem muro, não tem cerca que pode parar isso, que deve parar isso. Né? Então, a arte, com a arte dele, é, ele achou uma forma de comunicar essas temáticas, a temática, a temática da migração e a temática do conflito, e hoje vem falar um pouco mais, mais aprofundadamente é, da obra dele, tocando, nós pedimos especialmente para se aprofundar na parte temática, mas também na parte técnica e artística, né, para realmente entender como ele achou, com essas temáticas, um jeito é, de expressar a própria arte. Pietro, muito bem-vindo, bem-vindo, welcome, é, muito obrigado por estar conosco aqui. Obrigado. Jesus. O Pietro vai falar inglês, é... Algumas coisas em italiano eu vou ajudar. Estou aqui do, do, do seu lado. Acho que o microfone funciona. Só um pouquinho. 
Estamos aqui conectados online nesse momento, então tem uma, uma parte dessa grande plateia aqui, tem outra grande plateia virtual que está acompanhando você. Pode usar o meu. Thanks a lot. Hi to everyone. Thanks for the nice presentation. Thanks for Olivia for inviting me here in Rio. And thanks to you to be here. So the best way to know an artist, I think it's to see his studio. My studio is in Rome. You are all welcome. But I bring you a very short video just to introduce you my work, my words uh, from my studio in Rome. So first of all, I would like to show you this short clip about my studio. Sono Pietro Ruffo, sono un disegnatore romano. Questo è il mio studio, siamo a San Lorenzo, in un'ex fabbrica di pasta. San Lorenzo nel tempo si è trasformato, ma tiene sempre un'anima popolare, ma si è riempito di ragazzi. E, insomma, è un quartiere molto, molto vivo. Questo è il pastificio Cerve, il palazzo dove ho lo studio, che dalla fine degli anni Ottanta è diventato un palazzo del Fist. Questa libreria rappresenta un po' quello che ho nella testa, insetti, mappe. Ogni lavoro che faccio è un frullato degli elementi che stanno qua dentro e che poi ho in basso carta. E questo è il mio lavoro, lavoro fatto di carta, utilizzando bisturi, pinze, fili di spilli. Tanta pazienza e molte martellate. Questa è parte di Villa Mercedes, che è un punto che io amo molto, perché è questa natura che ti sovrasta, cammini all'interno del cammino. Una delle cose che mi piace più di Roma è il concetto di stratificazione. Qui in questo punto si vede l'acquedotto felice, che poi diventa una villa rinascimentale, fino a diventare l'arco di Sisto V e poi bruscamente interrotto dalla stazione Termini. Tutti questi livelli, tutti questi periodi, uno dopo l'altro, mi fanno pensare che ora è il nostro periodo e che ora noi dobbiamo fare qualcosa per questa città. So, as you have seen, I draw all the day, and I draw, I cut, uh, but I use basically very simple uh, medium, like graphite, watercolor, and mostly paper. All, all my work is done through paper, paper and drawing. And with these two uh, medium, I try to think about some subject topics that interest me a lot. Um, let's begin. No, just a second. It's not this one. Uh, 
che gli avevo dato con la chiavetta. Chiedo che ci mi rispondi in modo. L'aveva scaricata sul, sul computer. No, l'aveva già scaricata sul computer. Devo poi dire. No, questo è un mega, è 800 mega. L'aveva scaricata prima sul messo, computer, eh? dalla chiavetta. Sì. Okay, so uh, let's begin. First project that I would like to show you, it's my final ending um, project for my graduation in architecture. The idea was to do uh, the memorial for the victim of the Twin Tower in New York. So 2001, after the bombing of the two Twin Towers, uh, Daniel Libeskin win the project for the construction of the new building and he decided to keep a free area in the middle uh, to make a memorial for the victim. Okay, this is the project area and uh, there were many, many projects that were proposed. As you can see, there is nothing in this area. There is just something that it's very interesting for me. It's this salary wall that is at the end. Uh, so I have started from this wall and this wall is a wall that uh, it's put here for the Hudson River and it remind me a sort of wall of prayer and a wall where you can remember the victim. So the project that finally won, it's this project with two giant pool uh, instead of the two tower and a big park. So obviously this project, it's a project that have to deal with uh, an important topic that is death. How you can remember uh, thousands of victims of a terrible terrorist attack. And it's very interesting because there are many, many monuments uh, in the state and in all the world. Here you have a monument of the victim of the Second World War. So it's quite an interesting uh, topic to think about for a designer or for an architect. And this architect think that to remember something you need peace and calm, you need a park. For me, it was the opposite. If there is something that uh, it's that strong, someone came in your city and make this, so it's very strong and it's very hard for you. First of all, you need a kick in your stomach. And this kick, it's represented by a sort of earthquake. It's 
too strong to be just a park. First of all, you need something like an earthquake. So I have decided to uh, represent this earthquake, putting like five or six block of granite uh, height 60 meter. And this, in my imagination, gives you the opportunity to begin to make uh, a trip in your unconsciousness. After, you can go inside those kind of canyon and you think about what happened. You think about people that were deaf in this terrorist attack. And after, you arrive in this other part and you can remember the victim going through the slurry wall. So, just to say that uh, art is like music. An artist creates symbol, uh, like a musician use notes, and with those symbol, artists uh, talk and think about topic. The first topic that I would like to talk to you is self-defense. And to talk about this topic, I have used skull of animal. The skull could represent, in one way, a form of aggression, as you can see the teeth in evidence. But in another way, the skull could represent a sort of layering in the earth. So I have used this symbol to create uh, flags. This is the flag of Hamas in uh, Palestine so or lebanon flag so the flag it's created by those fossil and the idea was to represent population who are layered during the history in their territory but who need a form of aggression to stay in the territory where where they are layered so a sort of self-defense iran and if you think about some Medio Oriental countries, um, self-defense could be um, between your own governor or between a nation that is just between yours or between people that have a different religion between you. So there is an everyday self-defense. That's a flag of Syria. And this is my first solo show in a museum. Uh, it's in Italy. The museum was giant, and I have decided to do this show just with paper and graphite, the most simple material that you can find for an artist. And it's huge. Imagine that this is a door, and you can see so the show was very very big and um and it was interesting for me to to do a show with very poor material but i think uh drawing can be something very very strong also if you use very simple material after this i have created other work so we have talked about lebanon israel hamas but if you think how different nations use the idea of self-defense, uh, for example, United States, UK, or China, uh, use the concept of self-defense to make action of war far away from their borderline. So uh, something very easy to think about it, mostly in Europe, but I think also here, before the Second World War, every nation used to have a ministry of the war. The ministry of the war used to have tank, army, airplane, etc., etc. Um, after the Second World War, the ministry of war changed into the ministry of the defense. What is inside, it's exactly the same thing. Tank, plane, army, but just the word change from war to defense. So, what is defense for us? Uh, I don't know. 
10. Okay, what is defense for us? Um, I've used another symbol that's a beetle, and this kind of animal it's common in different parts of the world, but in a medio rental country um, it's a little bit different because he lives part of the day under the sand because it's too hot for him, and during the night he fly and he do whatever he does. So I have done uh this insect has a kirigami uh in on the top of a jewish prayer and i have created a small tank and after a big tank um another time thinking about self defense this tank it's uh covered by prayer uh it's about israel so the idea was to represent a population linked by the faith. So there are um, like 2,000 prayers. And in every prayer born an insect, that is a symbol of layering of the population of Israel in his territory, and a population that need a form of aggression to stay in the territory where they are layered. So another time it's talking about uh, self-defense. Another project, uh, it's about outposts. Outposts are a uh, small city, a uh, small construction um, built up during the night mostly um, between Israel and uh, Jordania uh, to occupy some territory. And I was quite interested in the way that they build up uh, those kind of construction very fast with wood or with metal. And another thing that interests me a lot in this country is archaeology. Archaeology in Israel is quite different between uh, our archaeology in Italy, where every layer has the same importance. So you cannot choose what is the layer that you want to find, because you have many, many layers, and every layer is important. Uh, here it's different, because uh, archaeology is mostly um, a work to find out presence of a past, but just one past, that is Jewish past. past. Um, and it's done in many areas, etc. So I was interested in these two things. Build up something to say that this territory belongs to you, and dig to say that this territory belongs to you because you have a past in the earth. So I have done this project, imagine to create some new outpost, and in the earth you find some excavation. So this was in a museum in Rome with the two first pieces. As you can see, it's like a container that is used as a tower, or another strange small construction. And when you go near to this, you can find some presence in the earth. Like if it was an excavation. And <clears throat> technically, how is done this? Uh, obviously, it's not easy to make an excavation in a museum, uh, mostly in Italy. So um, it's done like this. There is this box, this construction. There is a mirror on, on the floor. And 
this house that is quite big, all done with watercolor, cut out, etc., is put here inside, and the mirror reflects the house, but it gives you really the idea that uh, is an excavation in, in the earth. And this is how the house look like. Okay, let's go through. Um, another, so we have talked about freedom. Uh, I've shown you some example of work, but I have done thousands <laughs> of flag, thousands of other works about it. Um, after this, I was um, quite interested in a, in a philosopher called Isaiah Berlin. Isaiah Berlin was a teacher at Oxford University, and he used to talk um, a lot about freedom. Mostly about two concepts of freedom. The first concept of freedom is a negative freedom. So negative and positive freedom. Uh, negative doesn't mean that it's a bad freedom and positive that is a good freedom. It's just like a battery with a negative pole and a positive pole. So negative freedom, it's about uh, an individual freedom. So um, you are free from someone. You are free from a despot. You are free from an autocratic party. Uh, you are free from. Positive freedom, it's OK, you are free, but um, you are free with a group of people that are also free with you in, in your society. And with this group of people, you have to work to go through uh, a common goal. Sir Isaiah Berlin, I've uh, talked a lot about this topic, and for him, um, during the Cold War, the Soviet bloc was more about a positive freedom, a collective freedom, and the Occidental bloc was more about an individual freedom. So to study this, uh, his thinking, I have used another symbol, the dragonfly. Dragonfly, it's an insect that can fly very fast in different direction. So it gives me an idea of complete freedom but it's also an insect that have a very short life. So it gives me also an idea of fragility of freedom. I have done a big portrait about Isaiah Berlin on top of a Russian map. And I have tried to represent his thinking about this dragonfly cut out on the map, as you can see. And it's like if every dragonfly was free, but it's like if all the dragonfly all together are going to a common goal. In fact, for Isaiah Berlin, the problem of the Soviet bloc was this one, in the meaning that if someone has to tell you what has to be your freedom, uh, maybe you will lose a lot of individual freedom and maybe you will be not uh, free again. So it's, it's a sort of army of dragonfly and they're all going to, to a common goal. Uh, Isaiah Berlin was also a very, he uh, was an incredible writer, obviously, an incredible teacher and also he have done many um, radio speeches uh, at the BBC radio and one of these speeches was called the six enemies of freedom six philosophers between the French Revolution talking about freedom uh, this one is the Mestre this one is Fichte a German philosopher this one is Helvetius my favorite one um, Egel, 
German, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, French, and Saint-Simon. What about them? So um, they all start from different thinking. They're not similar as a political thinker, but they all say the same thing. What they say about freedom? They say, for too many times, population have lived under autocratic government or king or emperor. So they, do, they didn't know, population didn't know how to be free. So someone have to tell population how, how to be free. Someone like uh, a group of scientists for uh, uh, Helvetius or a political uh, leader or someone else. So um, why Isaiah Berlin called them uh, enemies of freedom? Because there is a sort of trap. If you imagine the last century, 20th century, uh, all the war, all the autocratic government, most of them were inspired by those philosophers. So when someone has this uh, idea, I know how my population can be free, you will do everything to give freedom to them. But this everything could be can be also terrible. If you imagine about, I don't know, Pol Pot, he was a big fan of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau didn't love a lot um, the bourgeoisie class, and so Pol Pot killed all the bourgeoisie class because bourgeois were too much corrupted and they they can't get uh, into a total freedom. So. The idea of Isaiah Berlin, it's that all those philosophers were great philosophers, but when men, mostly when leaders, have used their idea, they have committed incredible crime, the most big crime of last century. Um, for this show that was in 2009, I have also done six interview to six uh, philosopher that have worked in the past with Isaiah Berlin and that now talk about freedom. So I have asked them, okay, the two concept of freedom, negative freedom, positive freedom, in reality during the last 50 years have failed both. So what can be freedom for us, for our society? And what was interesting, it was that at the beginning of their uh, interview, they all defined themselves as a liberal thinker. And after, they've given me completely different receipt how to be free for our society. So I was very curious to understand how liberal thinkers uh, are different. For that reason, I have wrote down an application for Columbia University, and they invite me to, to make a work about political thinker uh, in the state, mostly uh, John Rawls, Robert Nozick, no, excuse me, Rawls, Nozick, and Working. Um, and I have studied them, I have made many work on them, uh, at the beginning, especially on Robert Nozick, uh, his most important book, it's Anarchy, State and Utopia. And uh, Nozick, yes, it's liberal, but it's like really an anarchic for him. Just the fact of paying tax, it's a sort of uh, an injustice. An injustice. <laughs> an injustice. <laughs> uh, so I have done um a group of work on uh, on his thinking uh mostly on a short part of his book called the tale of the slave where it describes um nine step between the slavery class class and our contemporary democracy But the most interesting work for me during those months in, uh, in the state was the Atlas of Various Freedom. So I have taken 
mini map uh, about many countries. And I have done interviews to young political thinker or student or teacher about what, what was freedom for them. So all those people were studying at Columbia University in New York. So all people used to travel or people with a very high degree of uh, study, etc. So I was thinking that there was a sort of same idea of freedom for those people. But depending on where those people were born, their idea of freedom was completely different one between another one. So uh, the map, every map was this big in a moment where I, have, uh, I was doing the, the portrait, I was also interviewing them. And I have discovered 40 ways of thinking about freedom, completely different. Freedom could be something that you have to fight for in your country, or freedom could be something that is more for men, less for women, for example, for a Mexican, uh, a Mexican girl. Or freedom could be something that uh, for an Irish uh, young boy, freedom could be something that your father and your mother have fight for. Now you have freedom in your country, but you don't know very well how to manage this freedom. Or many, many, many different idea of freedom. Uh, Alex Gurevich, that is uh, an American teacher of uh, political theory, uh, make this incredible interview telling me, you know, I was born in San Diego, uh, where freedom was to go into the shopping mall and choose 35 different uh, toothpaste, dentifrici. This was freedom for us. Um, and after <laughs> I have, not I, he, I have understand that freedom wasn't this. So freedom, it's not have that you can choose between 30 less than two or less than one. Freedom, it's something that you have to cultivate inside, uh, inside you and to work with the group of people between you to be free all together. So uh, another thing that he was telling me is that, you know, if you go on top of the mountain and if you have a big rock, circular rock, and you push it, this rock, it's free to go down. But this is not freedom. This is uh, cinetica, cinetic movement. So uh, freedom, it's to choose if you go down, if you can come up again, or if you can go left or right. And another thing that uh, it was quite interesting is say, you know, our country, it's defined uh, a very free country. So people don't know now how to manage very well their freedom. So they, everyone became a dictator of he, himself, maybe choosing an incredible um regime alimentare uh, see uh, eating just i don't know fruit or eating just this or eating just that or building up his body uh, giving to yourself rules that no one uh, from the exterior give you so why this because at the end we feel freedom just when we have enemies of freedom to fight for. It's very difficult for us to manage a complete freedom. We feel that we are free when we fight for freedom. When we go down on the street to ask uh, more money for the school or to ask liberation of a political prisoner or to ask something. This is the moment when we feel freedom. But when we have a complete freedom, how you can manage this? It's, it's very, very difficult for us. And it's very interesting for me 
So uh, I imagine I am free in a park, no? You imagine a park, you're free, you have sun, uh, here you have the, the beach. This is in Rome, we don't have the beach, but we have nice park. Uh, and I imagine to stay, to lay down in the park and to think just about myself and just about my freedom. And so I have done also here a body of work about this sensation. So I was in the park, in the center of some trees, and I have projected some line. And depending on how the trees were displayed around me and how the trees were high, I have done those work. So it's the vision of the tree from uh, from the low to the top, like this, they are all drawn. It. This shape come from how the trees are display, and there are many, many, many dragonflies that fly around me, like this. Not no more in order, like an army, but just around me. And uh, in reality, this body of work is born in two thousand and nine with him because I, I, I this is the concept, but the reality is that I used to push him in the park with Colaga uh, Rozzina, with the baby Carol uh, Bebe. Bebe was like this, and I say, what he look, this baby? <laughs> and so uh, this is uh, a body of work inspired by him. But after it comes conceptual and political, obviously. <laughs> uh, as usual, uh, the dragonfly are like a 3D work, a cut out work, and are displayed another time with pin. As you know, um, in museum and in entomology, the science that study uh, insect, you used to have all the insect with pin. So I have used uh this medium and i've done many many work everyone with a different shape this was a room for uh, uh the biennale of venice venice biennale and this is another installation another time about freedom it's a forest because always i imagine when you are for in a forest you work by your own you think about you and you try to to go deep inside you. And so uh, forest for me, it's a time of contemplation. And cut out, there is a wonderful, wonderful poem uh, written by Khalil Gibran uh, in this very um, important book called The Prophet. This poem, it's called On Freedom. And for me, studying freedom, 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 philosopher, uh, leader, etc. This poem, it's for me one of the most clever answer about what freedom is. The poem, it's beautiful and uh, it's very short. You can, you can have a look about it. But what the poets say is that before you ask freedom from a despot, before you ask freedom from um, an, an autocratic leader. First of all, you have to find freedom inside you because this leader, you have put this leader on his throne. One leader can do nothing, can't do nothing between thousand or million of people. So if the leader is in his throne, it's your fault, it's not his fault. So first of all, Try to find freedom inside yourself, and after this, try to uh, ask freedom outside. And obviously, the small house, you know, just the topic of the house, like this, it's another time, uh, like sort of thinking about yourself in a, in a private space. Okay, let's go ahead with freedom the popular will. So I was interested also in how different artists, uh, beginning from the Russian Revolution uh, until our day, have represented freedom. 
obviously, uh, mostly with political poster. So uh, I have done a research uh, about political poster. There are many, many books that talk about this topic also. And I was very interested in geometry that were used uh, to represent the common will. For example, here you have a triangle with all these people that are going into inside a book. Or this is a very nice poster. You can see on the top, the red side, there are all workers that are climbing, but they didn't do any effort because Lenin are guiding them. They are all in order. And here, the black part represents fascism and capi uh, capitalism, capitalism that are that is a chaos uh, falling down, etc. Or a Chinese one with the big wall represented by the army, like this, that is pushing uh, American and capitalistic. So geometry, very different. Norman Rockwell, we are in the United States. Someone is uh, taking his own speech inside a small community. Look the difference between the first poster and this one. In the first one, in the first one, two, three, you can see thousand, thousand of people. You can see what the leader wants from them, but you can't think about what everyone wants for himself. Here, also if it is a drawing, you can imagine this one, this man, what he wants to say. You can imagine his family. You can see that he, he has some paper in his pocket. So maybe he has prepared already his speeches. And so it didn't represent the community, it just represents one. Or another thing about political poster, population that create the face of the leader. So this was uh, the anniversary of Karl Marx with all the population that create the face of the leader. So the leader, it's one of us, because it comes from the population, but so it represents everyone, but it's like a little bit on, on the top. Uh, this is a fascist poster and it's very interesting as graphic because the face of Mussolini it's represented by dot and represent typography, represent uh, modernity. And all the body of the leader, it's done by population, used as dot. So a modern leader, but his power is created by population. That's an American poster, or uh, all the people that together create faith in the body of the Pope. Another thing, another thing interesting by political poster is uh, the use of part of the body. First of all, harm. This is a very beautiful French. May uh, May 68 poster with this young girl that is throwing a rock in the street. The beauty is in the street. So you use harm to, to throw something or you use or you uh, il pugno fist or you use fist uh, to unify all the population around you or you can use it to crash a tank, if you prefer. Or you can open the fifth in sign of victory with the arm uh, like symmetric. So the victory come 
through the arm, not through population, but just through the arm in this poster, obviously. Or you use something to break the chain. That's a poster coming from uh, South Africa against apartheid during the 80s. And, um, ah, sorry. Or you open your arm to use like a micro so your voice go to everyone. I have done a body of work about um, South African political poster when I was uh, working in Johannesburg, drawing some images uh, about Dutch people arriving in, uh, in South Africa and after cutting out those political posters. So in the same work, two very special moments for the history of South Africa. As you can see, another time, graphite, uh, cut out, and pin. This was a very nice place where I was in, uh, in the countryside of Johannesburg. And also, with some of the posters that you have seen, I have done a globe uh, with different posters. So uh, 100 years of poster from the Russian Revolution to occupy Wall Street, and poster in different parts of the world, looking how there is a sort of common language in 100 years of poster using the same co using the same color like black and and uh, red mostly the same font and mostly the same symbol. What happened after Occupy Wall Street? Um, the Arab Spring. So we are in 2011, 2000, 2000, yes, let's say 2011. And a lot of people through using internet uh, have decided to ask their freedom from a despot in Egypt, from Mubarak or another country, from other despots. And internet was used to um, find the place to go for the manifestation, but also to spread the message of freedom into all the world. So there is a, a sort of step over from the political poster by the use of internet. And I have done a collection of images of poster and we've and I've done another globe about spreading those message into those message of freedom into all the world. This globe it's quite big, it's like two meter high. But mostly I have done a body of work called Arab Spring using the floor of the Alhambra that it's a monument in Spain, one of the last Muslim monuments. In, uh, in Europe. And in this floor, there is written, there is no victory without Allah, without Mohammed. And I have substituted this with the slogan of freedom uh, of the young guys and women. And so this were the work with Arab map and with all this sort of net that go into all the world, and it's a sort of representation of internet. It's like an hypertext. If you click in one word, other five or six words will open, etc. And it's how uh, this, how the power of this revolution was spread into all the world. This is South America, Africa, India. That's another sort of globe. Another one. Another one. OK, we are going to the end. Um, that's another project 
this project it's about uh, nature and um, that's a botanical garden in Amsterdam where you have an incredible greenhouse dedicated to South Africa. You go inside, you really think you are in South Africa. And um, so they are the same plant, etc. But if you imagine uh, it's planted by men to show their, during, mostly during the end of the 19th century, to show to, I don't know, in Amsterdam, how were mm, the plants and the nature in the colonies. So like during the Roman Empire, Roman used to bring, I don't know, um, obelisk to show where they, they have conquered a little bit, those botanical garden grow up in the same way. So you represent nature, but is nature through power. So I have done a body of work representing those uh, plants of the botanical garden and cutting them with uh, camouflage. If you imagine camouflage, it's another, um, it's the most artificial way to represent uh, a nature by shapes and color. It's, and in another time, it's used by army. So another time, artificial nature through power. And with this technique, I have done a plane for the uh, first World War plane, very big, like one one dimension for the National Gallery of Modern Art in Rome. This is from the top. And it's all done with watercolor cut out and pin. And um, now we go a little bit more through design. Um, so um, the designer of Valentino fashion brand, they have see this plane have, and they have uh, draw some clothes uh, inspired by this plane. And after a little bit of time, they have called me and asked me to do um, a catwalk for, the, for a very important fashion show in Rome uh, about haute couture. And this was the place. We are in uh, Piazza, di, Piazza di Spagna and Piazza Mignanelli where they have uh, their um, building. And it's quite a huge space. And the concept that they asked me, it was to uh, draw something about Rome as a layered city. And I have never done something like this before. So I was quite surprised they, they asked me to, to do such a, a big work. Uh, usually they work with Dante Ferretti. Dante Ferretti, it's, some, it's someone that have won like 10 Oscar. Uh, and uh, I was at my first experience. So I have also asked to them, if they didn't find someone in between from someone that have won 10 Oscar and someone that have never done a kind of work like this, but they were quite, uh, they were quite convinced. So uh, what I've used as a mood board or as a concept was Rome, obviously, uh, archeological excavation with lion, line like this of step with nature and mostly with this pine tree that are like a symbol of our city. So this was my project, quite easy. <laughs> uh, and I have begin like if it was a canvas, like if it was one of my work. I have just decided a step, 40 centimeter, that is where you sit, 40 centimeter for a fashion show and where you walk, like for people to go to their seat, 40 centimeters. With this, I have begun to cut, and after using pin, I have to decide where you have steps, where you have people sitting, where the girl 
have to have to work. Uh, because it was impossible for me to imagine this uh, just drawing. I I need like a 3D uh, impression to to work on it. So once I have done this small model, I have after put pine tree around, make some sketch before, during, and after. And after, with a group of architects, just done some um, drawing about how it was. Fortunately, they have liked it. And we have done this. So uh, it's like an, archeolo an archaeological promenade. You walk, you see step, you can see archaeology from the top through down, or you can be in an excavation and you can have all the city that surround you. So this was the impression that I would like to give. This is one of the model, here we are inside. And imagine that it was a six month of work with a lot and a lot of people and a 10 day uh, in Cantiere, in, um, in in obra, um, all this for twelve minutes of a fashion show. <laughs> Incredible! I I have I, I need like one month just to understand why they were that crazy. Uh, but after I have understand this, and maybe I can tell you, um, I think that everyone know about. Um, communication that is one of the first thing for a fashion brand and for more brand so what they explained me after month and month that I can't sleep why they spend all this money for 12 minutes etc so Valentino, Dior, Chanel uh, and all these people have to buy pages in, uh, in the newspaper uh, and they make the the pages. I don't know with con la borsetta, con la borsa. So you can see the, the borsa, and you see Valentino like this. If I am a man, I do, and I go. I begin to read the newspaper. If I am a woman, I don't know. Ninety percent, I do this, or ten percent, maybe I look something. But there is not a big penetration of the message. In the opposite, if you do something like this, all the newspaper paper will write an article, and you will have in this article maybe an image like this, where you will not see Valentino written big like this you will see written an article and in the middle of the article an art uh, installation sponsored by Valentino. Just like this, but in all a page. And this message go more and more deep because uh, I, I don't understand immediately that they want to convince me of buy something. Uh, I just read a text about an art installation, etc., etc., and at the end, I see that is sponsored by Valentino. So it's something that penetrates much more uh, from uh, La Borsa, uh, etc. And so they spend a lot. Uh, and for artists, it's nice because uh, we don't have any more Pope, we don't have any more. Uh, Medici, Medici's uh, family. Now, what we have, fashion brand. Um, I have done another work for them in Miami for um, uh, Miami Basel, Arthur, and it was about hour of the work and also time that need uh, an artwork to be done or time that need a close to be done. So I have imagined those two desks, desk, and it's like if they're 
strength, strengthness, if the power of the work create this shape and the shape continue to move and create a sort of space. This was in Miami and this also was in Miami. Okay, let's go to the end. Um, I would like to show you mostly the work that's uh, my last body of work about migration. Another time I have used a symbol. So we have see beetle, we have see dragonfly, we have see skull. Now uh, I am using bird because they are obviously a symbol of migration. I can see these images through the door, through the window of, of my studio. And I imagine you can see also here in, in Rio, we can see this in all the part of the world. So first of all, the earth is round and uh, during history, many um, cartographers have used different way to represent earth. The most common is the Mercator projection. It's called a cylindrical projection. Imagine to take uh, A4 paper, uh, you make a cylindric, you put a tennis ball inside, you project, you open and you have your map. So th this is what we study at school, something like this. And obviously after you can change proportion, but this is no more geography, this is politic. Or if you want to make a globe, like the big one that I have done with Dragonfly or all the globe that you have in school or you can see, you have to do this kind of projection. So it's very strange because Earth, Earth, it's uh, a ball, but we can all only represent the ball through a bidimensional surface. And to rep represent another time the ball, we have to split in 12 uh, spiky, come di spiky d'arancia. To make another time the ball. So we are a little bit crazy, but it's the only way that we can work. So I have done also globe about this topic of migration. These are correct globe in terms of geography. And after they're drawing it, all these people that go from one corner to the rest of the world. So mostly you have three family of uh, projection, the cylindrical projection, the conical projection and the ad, ad, pro, azimutale or planar projection. And this is the body of work that I have done. So um, every work has a different shape because it's a different projection of, of the globe. And there are all these people drawn it with big pen in blue on top of a blue millimetrical paper and there are these birds that uh, fly. The concept, it's very easy. Uh, those people come from different parts of the world and from different time during history, we always have migrate for different reason, religious reason, political reason, economical reason, climate reason, like birds. Birds change their migration depending on, on uh, climate changing. So like animal, like migration of animal, we are animal and so we, we migrate. And also if there are wall, soldier, animal, we always continue uh, to migrate. You can also represent the word like a half. or like a star. And with this star projection, I have done last year a big uh, fashion show for uh, Christian Dior. Last year was the 17 anniversary, 70, sorry, 70, 70 anniversary of Christian Dior. And 
um, they have asked me to make the celebration for this. And so the, the idea was that Chris and Dior at the beginning have make a tour in the five continents to show his, uh, his work. And so the idea was to represent uh, this voyage, this trip of Christian Dior. One of the symbols of Christian Dior, it's a star, five point star. He had found this star, uh, a small star in Paris, and he said, okay, that's a symbol. I will build up my maison uh, the mod here. And this, this was. Uh, so I have taken the star as a symbol, and I have done two projections a Berghaus projection, so a projection of the world with a star, and a projection of the st of the star with a star of uh, of <laughs> della volta celeste. Sì, uh, celeste uh, has a star. Vabbè. Uh, so this was the project. So it was like uh, Teatro Mundi, uh, Baroque theater, uh, done as a star, with a giant dome uh, with the star. So this was the project. And after, and to represent the five continent, uh, the five continents were, re were represented by animal and by plants. Um, Oceania, uh, Asia, America, Europe, and Africa. And this was the painting for the, the sky. So this was the set. A uh, very big star. Every point represents a continent. Um, Africa, Asia, Oceania, America, Europa. This was the dome, and huge dome, like uh, 1,000 square meter dome, 42 meter, like San Pietro. But, but just for 12 minutes. <laughs> and the animals are like toys, no? Like dinosaur, when you are a kid, you make these toys like this, but just giant. 20% uh, bigger than the real animal. Lion, rhino, giraffe, eagle. That's the lion, and it was at the Embalid in uh, in Paris. Um, just to end, what is quite interesting is that um, I think the first uh, the first set that I have drawn, the one for Valentino, was more um, più architettonico, more arch architectonic. Okay. Mass architectonic uh, and was also more beautiful for public to be there. But this one was was very very powerful for uh, photo images, and it was what they asked me. They say we don't, mm, we are not interested about our seven hundred guests. We, because we pay them a five star hotel, we pay them a plane, we pay them everything. They will be happy also with a little bit of water. <laughs> so, didn't mind in how public see the show, because this was my focus how public everywhere see the show. For this, I have done a theater. At the end, they have done a set like this. And I was a little bit upset by this, but they didn't care. They was just interested by something. All the photographers are in one place and they have a perspective 
to shoot the girl with the dress. This is the more Im important thing because they, do they sell dress. So imagine you have a rectangle with the image of the girl with the dress. And after you have a 20% of the image that is out of focus because the girl is here and the rest is here. And with tw this 20% of image out of focus, you have to give the idea of all the concept of the fashion show. And here uh, we have put, let's see if I can find, yes, mm, mostly you have to imagine that the image that you can find on the newspaper, it's, it's something like this, cut here and cut here, no? Vertical image, small like this. You see the girl, but you also see the head of the lion, baobab coming from Africa, an eagle, and something here on the top. Um, so what they want, it's a concept that can be represented in two line. Here it was the five continent, very easy. And a concept that can be uh, very easy to understand also if you don't see all the set. Uh, finito. Ah, no. Uh, La Mostra di Rio. This is the show uh, of tomorrow. Please come. Uh, Cose la soes migra soes? Ecco. Pietro Ruffo. E, um, so, uh, for this show, the idea was that uh, we have to send quite easily the work, so I can't bring uh, my work with frame, with crate, etc. And so I have done work that can be rolled. And so I have, uh, this is South America. They're quite big, uh, drawing it with a Chinese pencil on um, and with Chinese ink. South America, North America. So here you don't have people and cut out map, but you have the people that create directly the map. Africa, Italy. Italy, it's like a sort of ladder, a sort of stair in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean seas. And it's like all these people are climbing on top of this stair, these stairs to go through Europe. And there is an elephant that throw a chair to stop them. India. And after you will see five tapestries that are done with the same uh, concept of the sky. And what was interesting for me, it's like, uh, you know, law change every month about how many people, every nation, how many uh, migrants ev every nation can take, how change the law on the borderline of the countries. So law change, change, change every week, every month, depending in the governors, etc. So media, it's like the migrant, he's uh, beginning his journey, no more looking on top of a map, but looking the sky. So tomorrow. If you come, you can see this work. Thank you. Grazie mille. Obrigado. É, excelente trabalho, de verdade. Eu, eu tinha visto algumas coisas, mas não tudo, não tudo. Realmente impressionante. Eu abriria, ainda tem um tempinho, vamos abrir algumas perguntas. Tem alguém já no público que quer perguntar alguma coisa ou vou quebrar o gelo? Já tem, vai. Pergunta. É, atrás? Atrás?
Um, congratulations. It was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> um, I loved your work. <laughs> and I think that you, know, you talked a lot about uh, freedom. And I think we face a very difficult challenge that is to overcome the, the definition of freedom that we inherited from the Cold War that it was a singular choice between polar opposites. And we have, a, we have a very hard time understanding that there can be a motion between those two opposite definitions and that we don't have to choose one and stick with it forever. And that's very, that's very, uh, evident in the communist propaganda and the liberal propaganda but when we when we analyze your work we can see a very delicate and and elegant um balance between those two we can quickly see the bigger picture the the frame that is defined there and then we can pay attention to the details and we can transit between those two spheres of your your work and that is extremely positive in that sense because we need that perception that we can do this we can have those two different um perceptions of it <laughs> congratulations <laughs> no, uh, thank you thanks a lot um you have to say something wonderful and you know you can be an artist you can be a singer you can be a lawyer we all every one of us think about history think about society think about freedom obviously and mostly you have a philosopher and political people that think about freedom but everyone as people think about freedom choose your own um, political man that represent you etc uh, as an artist but mostly as someone that draw what i try to do is not to give an answer an answer to uh, this big question what freedom is because i don't have the tool i'm not a political man so i don't know if freedom is white or black i don't, I don't know if it is red or yellow etc uh, but if you are a student or if you are a researcher to to think about a topic like freedom what you do you go to the library uh, here in the biblioteca you you find out 10 20 100 book you open and you begin to write something what i do it's the same thing just the different thing it's that what i write it's not uh, written it it's drawn it uh, and my exhibition it's not the summary or the final uh, uh, editing it's just displaying on a desk my notes so everyone after can have his own idea about this topic it's a tank some uh, an army of self-defense or it's uh, uh, something about aggression i don't know Maybe I know, but I, I don't want to give an answer. Uh, it's just every work of art. It's not an answer. It's just a giant uh, question mark. This is very banal to say, but it's uh, sometimes it's important. Um, I'll try in English, okay? <clears throat> um, we see uh, this this discussion about 
um, migration, voyages, since what? Since always. Uh, but uh, in the great voyages from Europe to the rest of the world, uh, it began to accelerate. And till today, because today some people are discussing how to go uh, off the planet, how to voyage to to other places. So first question, do you think this this desconforto, inquietude, this uh, has something to do with the discomfort uh, uh, of, of an artist. And just one other thing, uh, you work a lot with maps, uh, with, with paper, with uh, maps made from paper. And today we see those Google Maps, those, those digital uh, planning maps. Uh, does it this this digital transformation has something to do, or uh, I don't know, works in you somehow? Is it okay? Uh, I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I begin from the end uh, because uh, what you say it's very interesting. Uh, to came here, I take my phone and I have written yet and I arrive here. Um, a map, an antique map, a contemporary map, it's nothing about objective. It's always about subjective. I explain myself. Um, a map in the old past was something that was very, 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 very expensive. So the king of Portugal uh, have, I don't know, 10, 20 geographer commissioned them the map of the kingdom of uh, Impero Portuguese or the king of the emperor of Spain do the same thing. Uh, uh, in the antique Rome, they do the same thing, etc., etc. Uh, you need a lot of money to to create a map. No one can create a, ma a map without money. At the beginning, also now. Um, so, what is written inside the map and how is drawn at the map depends in who asks you to draw this map. Imagine that uh, something happened here in the beach and two journalists write an article of what happened here in the beach. I don't know, someone that uh, stole some, something from another one. There is a truth, I don't know, but those two journalists will write two complete different articles, uh, one between another one. So the map, it's not the truth. It didn't exist a truth uh, representation of the earth. Or you can say, yes, it does. When they went to the moon, they've taken images of the earth. This is true. And no, it's not. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, the images uh, of the 60s of the earth from the moon, that is the only truth representation, because it's not drawn it by something, it's just an image. The true images, you see the surface of the moon, like this, and you see the Earth, just small like this. They have to enlarge the images, because otherwise we feel like uh, persi nell'oceano. Perdido no mar. Cioè, La mente umana can't think that we are that small, just from the moon, imagine from another part. So, uh, also Google Map decide what kind of information put in a map. Obviously, you can't write everything. You can't write that uh, you li live uh, somewhere or you, you're uh, 
friend lives somewhere else. Uh, maybe you, you will choose just to write the name of restaurant or hotel, or, or maybe just the one that will give you money. I don't know. But also the way, just not, not just what is written, but also the way it's projected, it's chosen by someone. And so, why I say this? Because uh, reading map, it's incredibly beautiful because you understand history through map. Uh, so it's uh, a very interesting tool to understand past, but also to understand our present. Obviously, it's a little bit more difficult for us to understand our present. It's easier to understand past because we have history, etc. But what, what I want to say is that map, it's a tool that is not objective. It's very, very, very subjective. And it's for that reason that is interesting. And it's for that reason that I use map, also um, historical map, to begin my work. Imagine to ask uh, an architect to project, I don't know, uh, a museum for the center city of Rio. What he will do? First of all, he will ask you the map of Rio and after the morphological map, etc. Uh, so it's the same thing that I use because he find information on, on the map and from this he build up his building. Um, the, in the same reason, it's like if my work born from the map and uh, take his own life. This was the end. The beginning, it's very also very interesting. Um, um, usually, uh, in our time, when we talk about the world and about ecology, we say we are, uh, we usually say, or we usually listen, we are destroying our planet. No? So let's do something. We are destroying our planet. Um, no, we are not destroying our planet, obviously. This is banal to say, but also this time it's important. We are destroying our, uh, la nostra sopravvivenza. Si, la sopravvivenza on this planet. Planet, it's a rock with water. We, we can't destroy this planet have his own life that take billion and billion of years we are just like this we think we can destroy our planet but this is not true so if you use an egoistic way to think that it's the only way to think that is uh, strong in our mind and if you say we are destroying our humanity in this planet. So maybe in 10,000, 1,000 years, we will, we cannot survive on this planet. This I understand. And so maybe I can use less water or turn off the light, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But if you say we are destroying the planet, it's just not true. Also because sometime, and I come to your question, they define humanity as parasite. You know, like an insect. Eh. What do an insect? An insect, uh, the mom of an insect, laid his egg into a plant. When the egg open, the small insect will devour this plant, take energy from the plant, the plant will die, and the small insect will live in another plant or... This is a parasite. Nothing bad, nothing good. It's just a parasite. Um, sometimes they define humanity as parasite. No, we are not that intelligent as parasite because we are devouring Earth like small insect. But we cannot fly to another plant. So uh, unfortunately, we are also not parasite or no intelligent as parasite. Thank you very much.
very simple. The, the start was work with always from the concept. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> always from concept. I have to say yes, but uh, we we are working all together through drawing. So we know that concept is important, but it's also important for the high high C, so the composition of of a work. So there are some concepts, some idea that are strong into my into my head maybe because i have read some book or there is something that interests me but the things come together so i'm not planning like okay i want to talk about freedom let's read isaiah berlin let's take this is just how i uh, explain my work in, in one hour, uh, but it's something that is very mixed. Uh, maybe you have an idea of a color, or maybe you have just an idea of a concept. And this uh, imagine that you have in your head, in a way, can be embraced by a concept. Uh, things come. I think that things come together. Yes. So first of all, thank you so much because it's not easy, it's not common that an artist, an architect, a designer uh, explain in so small details uh, his work. So it's not common. Normally artists, especially artists, uh, they don't want to explain uh, uh, the inspiration and the process. And for us, it's very important to understand the process. So first of all, thank you so much. Congratulations for your work. And I'd like um, that we explain a bit more about the relationship between the importance in your work of the research. The moment of research, you explained that very well, but I'd like to, to know a bit more about that, the value of philosophical research, political research. And if you really think, uh, because my opinion, it's it come up from your work like, like that. Uh, I mean, it's clear that for you or for your work is not neutral is not political neutral not socially from the social point of view from the economic point of view neutral so if you think that the nastis uh has to be like like that what is your concept your, your idea of being uh, an artist in an artist from the political point of view uh so uh mostly uh we say and i think it's true that artist is a mirror of his society maybe a deformed mirror so you you don't see news on the television and you see what happened here what happened with trump what happened so this is a sort of reality artist it's like a deformed mirror but someone who talk about his time like Caravaggio have done, like Michelangelo have done, they, they have all been contemporary artists. And looking about those artists, you can see very well what was their time. So it's important, I think, for an artist to represent his view of his time. I don't know if um, the Maxi Museum, that is the most important museum in Rome, invite 20, 20 artists from Brazil, I will see something about Brazil. Maybe it's not the truth because 20 artists cannot represent thousands of people, but it's a vision of Brazil. Of if I see the work of Ernesto Neto or, you know, it's, it's something. Um, so this is, this is very important for me. You know, artists, designer, architect, uh, fashion designer, we all know how to talk an international language with drawing. You go to Miami, Basel, and you see 
thousand of abstract painting, wonderful. One it's done by a Chinese, one it's done in LA, one it's done in Mexico. And they're all the same because now the in the last five years, the mood of art is abstract. Uh, okay, it's there are some very nice picture and if you are Chinese, you can do abstract. If you are Mexican, you can do abstract. It's not a problem, obviously. But because young artists think that talking an international uh, language of art, uh, you will you will have more possibility to to exhibit your work everywhere. Okay, I have done many artists residencies all over the world and uh, with people of my ages coming from different parts of the world. And for me, the interesting thing was to see that the Mexican artist was Mexican, French artist was French, and the Italian artist was Italian. Uh, for me, for example, why I am Italian? Because I born in Rome and I've, I didn't born in uh, Brasilia. Uh, Rome, it's a very layered city. Uh, and as you have seen, all my work are layered, layered, layered. Like one images like this, if this was a building, it's never built just in one time. It's before Roman, after medieval, after Renaissance, after I take this top and I make a window for a church, after I take this, I put in the other side and it comes a stadium for uh, football. Rome, it's like this. It's using the past to build up the future. And a little bit, my work also, if you didn't talk about my city, but the way it's, it's composed, the way it's painted, it comes a lot from where I born from in Rome, in Italy. I think if I was born in Brasilia, build up with a concept and a strong drawing, but in one time, mostly, my way of working was completely different. And so I love to see an artist coming from Brasilia doing something very different from me. Uh, so this is uh, about uh be different also if you know how to talk an international language um about concept uh i think that the most power powerful thing is to have passion uh because i am an artist i work by my, by my own but also have you as you have seen i can work for a brand what brand needs are concept, small concept, not too much philosophical, <laughs> and uh, that can be displayed in, a, in, in two or three line and understand very easily. And for me, it's very interesting, like for all the designer to um, think with, with a pencil. So uh, think about problem, not problem, that like I am sick or but um, question think about question with a pencil and this is the most fascinating thing uh, to solve a problem or to think about question with with a pencil so I can think about philosophy or I can think about making a new thing for water Last week, they've asked me to make 100 uh, pool biliardi. No, proprio il tavolo del biliardo. Eh, 100 for the for this thing. <laughs> I've never, I've never done one, but it's interesting for me to to think about it, uh, like all the all the designers. So to think, and mostly. To, to end this conversation. What is the difference between an artisan and an artist? Well, we can talk hours about this. Something that I think it's that an artisan, it's someone that know very, very, very well 
how to do his work probably better than anyone else. An artist, it's something that every day they ask him to do something and he have no idea how to do this. So it's like if it is if he is jumping from uh, powder sucker uh, without uh, nothing, but he have to do this best from anyone else. So artist, it's someone that every day do at the best something that he have never done before. When you begin to do something that you know, when you are comfortable in what you're doing, it's it begin the problem. Design. Good question. I'd like to ask this question. I have a, I have, I have hey, please. Um, I have a lot of um, time. I think I must uh, he like you. Yeah. I think a design uh, an artist is like you answer that you have a pension and you have questions, issues, and you have uh, something abstract to decide when it's going to be understood by people and they have no one answer, uh, multiple an answers. And a design, you have to do a concept by Dior. You have to be strict. It's an, 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 uh, you have to answer a question. I mean, you have to answer for to be a, like a, for Valentino, like a show in the middle of the city, more Italian probably, and Dior must be more famous. Uh, so I think that's the difference. I I I'm 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 a business. I'm I, I'm not an actress, not a designer. So I think it's the market is the middle of the designer and the artist. So. A designer have to give a uh, marketing an answer, a question, um, they have the marketing question to to solve, and then that's not have the human issues to think about and question. That's my point of view. So I would like to know yours. Uh, I think everyone can give you a different uh, answer to this question. Um, I think when you do artists as a work, as a job, uh, a little bit it change. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, in my atelier that you have seen at the beginning, to arrive you have a giant elevator. You open the elevator and you are in the studio. Wonderful. Uh, the elevator is quite big, but not big like this room, just, I don't know, an elevator. The bigger work that I can do, it's the diagonal of the elevator. I can do a work bigger than this because otherwise it will not get out of my studio. So I'm not free. Eh, yes, but it's more <laughs> difficult. So just to say that every work you do, if you are an artist, if you are a designer, etc., have you have to think about what will be the life of this work, no? Uh, uh, for example, the plane also, you have to go through uh, a door. The door can be big, but not eight meter big. So all the plane, it's thinked and drawn it to be dismantled, to be in crate. The crate have to go in a van. The van have maybe to go to the state. So you have dimension. It's, uh, you know, you can imagine about a bohemian artist that drink wine in Paris all the night after he go in his studio and he make uh, a masterpiece. This exists mostly in a book. Uh, um, uh, uh, for me, I am like a post, uh, not post of, so uno che lavora le poste. Si, I go working every day at nine in the morning. Routine. I eat every day at 
five minutes before one. Uh, I, I I do some hours of drawing, some hours of research, some hours of, but the, and because I can do whatever I want, I am completely free. I need to give me very strict rules, like the American. I, I become the dictator of myself. So um, mm, I don't find a lot of difference between an artist and a designer that draw this or this or this. No, I, I can't find a lot of difference because yes, you can say that these after have to be um, multiplied in thousands of same things. This could be a difference, but if this was just done one or thousand, it changed a little bit how you conceive, but Mm, not the happiness or the uh, or the um, happiness. Sorry, or la paura, or how much you are afraid in the moment you are drawing something. Because create, create something. Yes, give happiness at the end, but at the beginning, it afraid you a lot, a lot and a lot. You are always afraid. And and, uh, and this is nice when the work is finished. You you make the show and everyone is happy. But uh, when you are afraid, it's the more interesting uh, moment. It's for this that I prefer to be afraid during the morning, that during the night, <laughs> after being drunk, <laughs> I can <laughs> I can be afraid, but with more calm. Hi, good night. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, I, I guess you have many, many contracts, many people that contract you to work for them. Not me. Some. <laughs> yeah, some, some. And I, you told about you that you have, you have to, you must have a routine to develop your job. And if you don't have, let's say, if you are on a sabbatic period uh, what would be your like three main projects to say something to people to shock or to to make them uh, aware of something today um, uh, the the last work and mostly uh, a lot of work that you have seen come from an individual uh, inspiration by what uh, is interesting for me, etc. The show, if you come tomorrow, that you will see tomorrow, no one asked me uh, what to do or what to draw. Uh, so, but, so this is true. So. For example, the show of tomorrow, it's something that I could be, uh, I could do in a sabbatic year. But the, um, I think, for example, the show of tomorrow, there are some uh, interesting things um, that I think thinked about just because the show need to be uh, enrolled and shipped with tube to be less expensive for the shipment and this gives me idea in how to do new work um, there are special effects of light etc you will see this tomorrow um, so i think always that from a problem you find solution and this solution can be helpful for all uh, all your work so uh, to be isolated in a sabbatical year in the top of the mountain without no one, uh, I think I will be confused after one week. Uh, I like to work with people. There are seven uh, people that work with me inside the studio in Rome. There are other people that work outside the studio. Uh, I like the group and I like the problem. Uh, and this gives a lot of energy in the work in the work for me 
maybe for someone else prefer to say by his own but also you know when i do an artwork and uh i finish the artwork the artwork is framed so finally i see the work for the first time i look this work and i didn't understand if it is a good work if it is a bad work um it's not just like uh, a piece of me it's something completely different like uh, my son that is i don't know where it is uh, it's not uh, a part of me it's like a roommate that live with me in the same house and i am discovering him uh, as uh, his own car his own uh, idea etc but uh, it's not me it's he and the artwork is he and I see the artwork and I say, well, and so people that come in the studio and say, ah, this could be interesting. This helped me a lot, a lot and a lot and a lot, talking with people about the artwork. When you do a good artwork, when you do a bad artwork, it's terrible. It is in colla dosso, like a glue. You, you have uh, like this, you can't detach from uh, from you it's uh, in fact when when they say you're not um, you're not uh, non sei triste you're not um, yes yeah, sorry yes you're not sad when you sell an artwork no <laughs> not at all uh, i'm very happy and i'm very happy that uh, he go by his own like when my son will go to university he go i will be very happy uh, if he have, I hope not, if he have some problem in studying or money, you know, it's like, no, it's attack like glue. So just the work that are not, uh, you, you immediately understand. Where when they, when they, when an artwork, it's not coming in the right way, uh, you can change it, change it, change it thousands of times, but yeah. Yeah, no. yeah uh, you, you can't manage. <laughs> when, it, it. when it begins wrong, it, it's not. No, it's to the end. It's yes, wrong. but it's not easy to understand for for an artist <laughs> when it's wrong. You know, if you are a designer, uh, you have much more. Um, you speak much more in his produ who he's producing this. You speak much more on in who more much more feedback see if you are an artist uh, uh, you don't have feedback if i do my work as an art or as a, a circle uh, nobody care uh, just someone will buy or someone not uh, but uh, so i prefer to don't do at the moment a sabbatical year <laughs> At the moment, or if I do, I will come here in Rio. It will be fantastic. Thank you, grazie, obrigado. Obrigado, gente. Boa noite para todos.